There's been a lot of talk about a global minimum tax, a new way to tax businesses in the digital age. And while this is constantly evolving and news is constantly coming out, I've been talking to some people in my network to get their thoughts on this and putting some thoughts together of my own. I'm going to share with you today what I think about the global minimum tax. Hi, I'm Andrew Henderson, and of course, I think the global minimum tax is ridiculous. It's the latest effort from the high tax lobbying groups like the OECD who hate competition to take more of your money. But I'm going to give you my thoughts now. You know me as the author of the book Nomad Capitalist and the founder of the company Nomad Capitalist, where we help seven and eight figure entrepreneurs and investors legally go where you are treated best. You can learn more at nomadcapitalist.com. The big question that everyone is asking is, is this nomad capitalist stuff even going to work if they can push a global minimum tax through? And my answer is absolutely, because the thing that we're seeing all around the Western world, the countries that are part of these bullying high tax groups like the OECD, is that taxes domestically are going up from Joe Biden in the U.S. to many other Western countries around the world. There's not a lot of competition. And so even if you were to see some kind of new taxes, which I'll share my thoughts on in a moment, uh, being offshore, it's still going to be a better deal substantially to be uh, where you're treated best. And so I'll come back to that. One of the things that frustrates me whenever I see this talk of the global minimum tax is they talk about the race to the bottom among corporate tax rates. And they talk about how companies like Google and all the big tech companies, companies with brands get to park things like IP uh, offshore, get to move offices all around the world, and basically get to take play, uh, part in countries that have low tax rates, um, whether it's 12.5% Ireland, you know, 8.5% on some assets in Switzerland, or even zero in many of the offshore jurisdictions that we talk about. What it says to me is, Western countries and a few non-Western countries that are in that OECD pack, they don't like competition. Imagine you had a grocery store, for example, who sold bananas, and one store sold bananas for you know a dollar for a kilogram, right? And then another store opened up down the street selling them for 80 cents a kilogram, and then the stores started competing. The same that you see with, with gas stations or so many other consumer staples and, and things that are sold business to consumer. That's a race to the bottom that people like because it's more accessible for consumers. And by the way, in many cases, you see the savings that companies are accruing being passed on to the consumer, and you've seen lower consumer prices. Now, thanks to inflation created by governments, you see prices going up. But uh, you know, businesses have been able to take advantage of lower tax rates by going where they're treated best and finding countries that didn't want to tax the heck out of them for the privilege of having part of their business there. That should be a good thing. But unfortunately, in today's world, governments that want to pick your pockets, legacy brand countries that think they deserve money merely for existing, hate the idea of competition and they call it a race to the bottom. Now, my thoughts on the global minimum tax overall is that, again, this is still evolving. There are a couple different so-called pillars of this global minimum tax. And the initial thing, one of the things that a lot of tax people I've talked to around the world point to is, well, the first target of this is going to be these big companies. And they've set you know, different revenue targets for what makes you a big company. But it's going to be a very high number that you know, most people watching this are not going to hit. They're going after the Googles, the Netflixes. There was even some talk for, for parts of these proposals where they're basically, you know, the U.S. is companies in the U.S. are saying, well, you're basically just coming after us because you're basically calling out these biggest U.S. tech companies and you're putting them into this global minimum tax to benefit you know, Europe and other members who have long complained that the U.S. tech companies aren't paying enough uh, locally. And so that would be the first part. Now, the second part that could roll out is that they do want to set a 15% minimum tax rate around the world. Now, what is also being discussed, though, is that countries will be allowed in some way to continue to set their own local tax rates. And so if you are the UAE, for example, and you want to continue to tax your spice sellers and washing machine retailers and you know whomever else at 0%, you can do that. And so everyone can have their own local tax rate. Now, the talk among people that I work with is that perhaps you would see something like the common reporting standard with banking, where you first had the U.S. introduce its FATCA information sharing regime, where all the foreign financial institutions who wanted access to the U.S. financial system had to report information on so-called U.S. persons or people they thought were U.S. persons to the U.S. government. And so after that rolled out this worldwide system where now a lot of different countries exchange information with each other. 
the thought is that that system, number one, is somewhat flawed. There are countries that are signed up to be part of CRS that aren't really, I don't think, sure what they're doing. And you also have a number of countries that haven't signed on to CRS yet, and a number of them that have no date to sign on. Now, you have the biggest players, the Cayman Islands, the UAE, the Singapores, all those big jurisdictions have indeed signed on. But the thought is that if there was to roll out a global minimum tax on a uh, level that apply to all corporations and not just the biggest ones that number one we have a number of years before that's probably ironed out now it's possible that could be faster but right now that is the consensus that i'm hearing what you would also see is you would see perhaps jurisdictions starting to fall like dominoes and so this is where the bullying aspect would come in this is why i've said that perhaps you know a jurisdiction like a hong kong part of china might not be the worst place to have a company and a lot of people have said they don't trust hong kong anymore I think that perhaps you want to have your company based in a jurisdiction that has some heft. Because what we've seen is countries like Barbados, countries like Belize, which have been bullied. And what they've done is come up with pretty creative things where they've actually come up with regressive taxes where the, the more money you make, the lower your tax rate goes. Uh, but they've basically been bullied into saying, hey, you, know, you can't really have two different tax regimes for onshore and offshore. Why is it that Hong Kong hasn't had that yet? So I certainly think a country with some heft is going to want to be a place to, to be established. What I also think this is going to potentially push companies into doing is, you know, having more presence. You know, historically you've seen, you know, companies that sell stuff online, for example, they go and incorporate in the BVI or in Hong Kong or in the Cayman Islands even potentially. And it's basically just a flag of convenience. And so that's been a great thing for smaller businesses, lifestyle businesses, things that are run entirely remotely. What I think the wave of the future might be is pushing more companies into establishing local ties if you want to keep using these potentially lower local tax rates. So what we've been doing, not really related to the global minimum tax, but what we've been doing for other reasons is setting up now a management office in uh, the UAE where we will hire and have started to hire you know, high level managers who run the business and who run our teams around the world, which we basically contract out um, through different companies that we have. Uh, those people will be based and they'll be, management will be in uh, a tax-free jurisdiction. So I think that the days of potentially having people all over the world, that's going to become streamlined. I think one mistake people make when they're offshoring their company is they ignore having workers in especially the U.S., but having workers in other high-tax countries where there are potential issues uh, in terms of permanent establishment and things like that. Uh, I think bringing people in your company potentially into one office, under one tent, into one country could potentially be beneficial in the future for taking advantage of more liberal tax rules. Now, what could happen in the coming years, going back to my CRS example, is you could see some bullying of these larger jurisdictions where maybe one time you, know, you get a, a country like a Barbados or a Vanuatu or something just say, all right, we're out of the tax-free game. We're now a country with taxes. You saw that in the EU a number of years ago, um, well, where the two EU countries of uh, Spain and France bullied their neighbor, Andorra, into imposing a tax uh, on uh, residents and, and, on, uh, and on businesses. And so could you see where an Andorra, you know, or a Caribbean island followed by an Andorra, then followed by maybe you get the big one, maybe you get, you know, one of the, the Gulf countries, you know, maybe they just say, all right, we want to be friendly, you know, we'll, we'll give in. You know, then maybe you see a Hong Kong. What could happen over the course of years is dominoes where countries will start to apply some kind of basic rate. Now, the question then is, do you see some countries applying a sort of Malta principle where they say, okay, our rate's 15%, but we're going to refund something to you. Are there going to be some loopholes that they can use to where countries that want to attract business will be able to, you know, reduce the rate below this, this theoretical uh, minimum of 15%? So that's going to be the interesting question is exactly, you know, how long this takes to roll out. Will it entirely roll out? I'm not entirely convinced it is. I think, as I've said, you know, taxes around the world are, give, are, are going up. Again, the good news here, quote unquote, is that you know, taxes are going up in all these Western countries that are pushing for this, or at least most of them. And so the opportunity to be offshore, you know, if it's 15 and maybe you get half of it back, um, that could still be a good thing. Again, I don't see that happening overnight. I think it's going to take time. I don't necessarily think a business that makes you know, five or $10 million a year is in the crosshairs to the extent that the bigger tech companies are. That's what this is about. Now, on the other hand, you look at what happened, for example, in the Trump tax reform, where the goal was to get big companies to repatriate their money, and everyone got swept up into that because the law was either very poorly worded or the goal was just to sweep everybody up, every guy who had a half million dollar a year business around the world. So there certainly is sometimes uh, there are some unintended consequences. Now, you know, 
Am I worried right now? No. Am I going to stop my plans to go offshore? No. There are plenty of ways to still pay zero tax. And what I'm saying and what I've been telling people that I work with is go to a jurisdiction that has some heft. Go to a jurisdiction where the culture is in the right direction. Cayman Islands, for example, people do not really believe in direct taxation. The UAE, historically, zero. Um, again, other jurisdictions that have historically been good that are not tiny islands that have already been bullied out of other things, those are the places where perhaps you want to consider. What I also think that any kind of future tax would bring is other opportunities that you're not thinking about, which is countries are going to start to be competitive. If there is now a, a flat rate, you're going to have new countries that you wouldn't have considered before saying, hey, bring your business here. We'll take your 15%. Again, maybe we'll kick you back something if that's, if that's possible. Maybe we'll have some other opportunities for you. But you know, which country wouldn't want to bring in a business making $10 million if the tax rate is even you know, 5 or 10% or 15%? That's a lot of extra money in their coffers. And they can say, hey, listen, uh, we're going to put you in a fast track to citizenship, or we're going to open up residence permits for businesses that have you know, X amount of tax. Russia has had a fast track program of sorts for businesses that pay a certain amount of tax if you want to immigrate there. So if you're bringing tax dollars to the country, I think other countries could introduce that because what you've seen, even among higher tax EU countries, you know, you've seen where countries still need to bring in business. You look at a smaller country like Portugal, why are they more competitive in many ways than their neighbor Spain? They're small. They need the revenue. They have to be somewhat pragmatic. A lot of countries in the world are small and they're going to look at this, I think, as a way to roll out the red carpet for someone who can come in and all right, if you've got to pay a million dollars in tax somewhere, you can go there, you can get other advantages. Now, what I also see is an opportunity where you might want to expand your business to not only be doing, you know, having management in one place and therefore, you know, this whole thing of remote, everything's totally virtual, may be something that's clamped down on. And so that may be an opportunity for, for a decent sized business to start putting people in one place. I also think, you know, doing business with different countries, sure, the US or Europe can make it difficult to say, hey, you're selling stuff here, that could be difficult. Again, I think if you're selling services, for example, that's gonna be a harder thing to go after because are you gonna go after uh, a lawyer in let's say the UAE and say, hey, if you have an American customer, you've got to pay tax. Certainly there is some precedent for doing that with certain withholding taxes in countries. I mean, it's not unfeasible entirely, but I think that's gonna be a harder thing to do. But what I would also say is, you know, if you're doing business with emerging countries, which are gonna theoretically push back on this, that could be an opportunity. Now, am I suggesting you change your entire business model to accommodate not paying a 15% or some fraction of that tax? No, what I am saying is if you're a company like Nomad Capitalist, something that I've always been intrigued about is the idea of going and selling in emerging markets. We obviously have some people from those emerging markets. We could potentially have more. And so if you're in a business that can theoretically sell to anyone, you might be looking at, again, in kind of a CRS example scenario, there are going to be countries that don't sign on to this at all, and you will still be able to open local offices or even just sell into those markets. And so think about you know, what's the future of your business? If you're growing your business, it might be a good idea to start moving employees into more tax-friendly locations. Uh, I know a lot of people are going virtual right now. However, again, there are some challenges with having virtual staff. I know a lot of people like to say, oh, I've got independent contractors. They really have full-time employees who do what they say. Having those people in uh, higher tax countries with very strict tax codes, the kinds that are pushing this global minimum tax, probably not the best idea going forward. Moving them to a central hub with zero tax or low tax could be a great idea for some people. And then again, looking at new business opportunities uh, of marketing into countries that are not going to be part of this could be a great way to continue to enjoy tax benefits under the old system. The bottom line is this is not something I see happening tomorrow. I think it'll happen over a course of time if it happens at all. I'm not necessarily adjusting anything that I do right now other than if this gains more steam, if this starts to come after people who are smaller fish, then we adapt. Uh, but with taxes going up around the world, not only do you want to go somewhere that's more business friendly as well as tax friendly, but you want to look at, you know, what's your company going to be in the future? Quite frankly, I'm all for the remote work. I'm all for the stuff, the stuff that has proliferated, you know, after COVID. Uh, but I do think that, you know, from a tax perspective and probably from a management perspective, more centralization will be beneficial. There will be other opportunities if this comes out. For now, it's business as usual. So people ask, Andrew, how do I get the most out of Nomad Capitalist? How do I begin my Nomad Capitalist journey? The first thing people do is they start right where you're at. 
They watch YouTube. They listen to podcasts. They read articles at nomadcapitalist.com. We've spent years creating thousands of pieces of free content so that you can get the vibe from someone who's actually done this, from someone who's actually been in your shoes. What they'll do next? They'll get a copy of the book. You can find it on Amazon. It costs a few bucks. And while it's not going to give you all the secrets, it's going to, again, give you more of the vibe. You're going to learn a lot of the things that I've learned. You're going to learn some strategies you can employ, and you're going to get a lot further in your journey. From there, if you are the seven or eight figure entrepreneur investor, you can go to nomadcapitalist.com. You can click become a client. We're pretty busy these days, but we have availability to help a limited number of people who want to create a holistic plan, something that I think is so important. So if you want to do that, go to nomadcapitalist.com, click become a client, learn more about how it works and how we can help you.